and welcome to everybody joining us again today for the third of our FLA Forum webinars. Um, again, a huge welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming again after joining our first two. And today we're going to look at sales and distribution, um, which again is a very pertinent issue right now. So the FLA Forum, again, this is a, an annual event that we have every year at the Goy Film FLA. It usually happens on a Thursday and it's our opportunity to look at uh, the things that are affecting the industry and maybe cast our eye out to the future. Um, the FLA Forum is bought, brought to you by the Goy Film FLA and the RAP Fund. And we've also been supported by the Screen Skills Ireland, Screen Ireland, uh, Creative Europe Media Desk um, and Ace Producers. So we're very thankful for that support. Um, if any of you do want to share your comments with us, uh, you can join us on social media using the, the hashtag FLA Forum. And also uh, there will be an opportunity at the end of the chat just to maybe submit some questions. So there is a Q&A function if people would like to do that. Um, and I'll pop back on at the end and uh, give those questions to our panellists. So without further ado, I do want to call on our five great panellists. We have Katie Holly, who's going to chair the session. So we have Eamon Bowles, Cara Cusimano, Patrick O'Neill and Stephen Kelleher joining us from right across the globe, New York, London and Dublin. Um, and as I said, we're going to kick off this discussion about sales and distribution. I think Katie's a great person to lead this chat. I mean, she's a very prolific producer. We all know having produced great films like Love and Friendship and The Pervert's Guide to Ideology. And I think Katie, I'm writing saying that you have, you're in post-production on a, on a co-production and you have two new films just about to hit the market in The Racer and Boys from County Hell, a blinder film. So no better person to ask some of these questions or challenges that may or may not be facing us. So I'll hand over to you all. I said I'll pop back on after about 50 minutes or so. And um, if people do have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks. thanks very much and uh, welcome everyone. I just want to say a huge thanks to the FLA. Obviously it's um, kind of bittersweet that we're doing this virtually rather than all being on pers in person in Galway. Um, but it is amazing still to kind of be able to get everyone together. And also thanks to Sarah for putting these panels together. This has definitely been one that I've been really <laughs> looking forward to talking to you all about. I think what now the future of sales and distribution is the biggest question in not only producers' minds, but filmmakers' minds and anyone, anyone who works in the industry. So um, I'm very much looking forward to getting all your views and opinions, both the kind of good, bad and ugly. Um, so maybe it would be great, first of all, to just do a little bit of an introduction about who you are and your role in, in the company. Maybe starting, Car with you um, uh, for Tribeca. Sure. Uh, I'm Cara Cusimano. I am the festival director at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, I've been with Tribeca for 13 festivals. Um, and I oversee the, the programming um, both at the festival, the TV festival, year-round programming, um, obviously some of the, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into, kind of the, the pivots that we've done to more virtual events and drive-ins and things like that over the last few months. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And I, I think I have some of the same questions that everyone else has. So I think uh, it'll be really interesting to talk about kind of what comes next for all of us. Great, um, Stephen? Hi everybody, um, I'm Stephen Kelleher, I'm one of the co-founders and director of Bankside Films, which is an international sales, finance and production company based in London. Great, Eamon? Uh, I'm Eamon Bowles, president of Magnolia Pictures and uh, distribution company in the United States. And, uh... Great, I'm Patrick. Uh, yeah, I'm Patrick O'Neill, managing director of Wildcard Distribution. So. Uh, we're a distributor based in Ireland, but we distribute in Ireland as well as the UK, uh, theatrical, DVD, video on demand, TV. Great, thank you. So um, I think, I mean, the way that this pandemic has affected the industry has been so, <laughs> so all encompassing, I think from every aspect. Um, Sarah was just mentioning my own project. So we have a, a co-production that's in, um, in post at the moment, but it's a big international one where directors are supposed to travel and none of that's able to happen anymore. I literally, before this panel started, finally got an email after four months confirming that our insurance claim has been approved, which is an amazing relief. Um, we also had two films that were due to premiere at festivals, world premiere at festivals. One was set by Southwest, another was Tribeca. Um, and we also had films that were on kind of theatrical release and all of those things have had kind of massive impacts, not only, you know, then the later side is kind of when films can kind of get back into production again, but it would be, and the same goes for festivals, sales, distribution, financing. Um, it would be great to hear, um, 
I guess, a little bit about your experiences of kind of the impact and maybe some of the measures that you've been taking to, to uh, try and react to what's been going on. And starting with you again, Cara. Yeah, I think so. This all um, kind of ha happened right when Tribeca was coming up. So I think we were one of the first festivals affected. Um, we had to can cancel our existing event technically postponed. So we're still hoping to hold a festival um, in 2020 um, in, in March. So I think we were um, kind of flying blind a little bit because all of the events right around then were, um, were figuring it out and didn't really have a framework to look at. And I think the first, um, the first idea that a lot of us had was to go online, to go virtual. And, um, and we were able to do that successfully with a number of our programs. But I think being, being first was also limiting in a way because um, there was still an uncertainty over what that meant, particularly for sales. I think that was a big question a lot of filmmakers had. So so when the appetite was there for on the festival side, on the filmmaker side, um, there still wasn't a structure in place yet for um, for the business side. And um, and but we still saw amazing results. Twice as many filmmakers opted into our online programs as um, typically do in a year where we have a physical festival. Um, and now I think you're seeing more and more festivals doing that successfully, and more and more um, kind of business happening. The Cannes Marche being a great example of that. Uh, and then we've also been doing uh, drive-in screenings. So we just kicked off in New York last night, actually, with Palm Springs um, here in the city and uh, trying to kind of still bring socially distanced um, in-person screenings around the country, uh, however possible. Amazing. Stephen, what about for you, obviously, from a sales point of view, it's quite a lot to react to thinking about okay what is the best strategy now do we hold and wait and and, and the uncertainty of when we're going to get back again and also I know that your bank side is also very involved from a financing point of view on many films I think I read something Phil Hunt was saying that you had to charter a plane to get everyone back on the Martin McDonough film <laughs> um, so there's obviously a lot at stake you know for you it'd be great to hear where, where you are yeah, I mean, when this all happened, the huge question mark was, is our business about to kind of fall off a cliff edge and never come back? You know, I think it was as, as serious as that for everybody. And it took a while for us to get our heads around it, for sure. Um, ourselves, we had three films that should have been in production now and all three of those were postponed, obviously. And I think they will get back up later in the year once insurance issues are sorted and, you know, COVID processes are in place. But that, you know, as a company for us, that represents a huge gap in your cash flow. You know, three films in one go just gone. So we had to suddenly kind of reconfigure and think, you know, how are we going to address this? Um, you know, one of the things that we really used the lockdown period to do was focus very carefully on acquisition and, you know, acquisition of films that were already in the can that had already been shot and were in post and didn't have a sales company in place. And that's, you know, that's not an easy thing to do because you still need to make sure that the films have quality and have audience potential and kind of fit with our brand and, and our movies that we, we are passionate about and want to distribute. But I think we did a pretty good job of that and we actually ended up picking up three films that had already shot and um, we, we saw some footage or we saw some scenes and felt you know confident enough to say we can do a great job with this so that's kind of helped in in one way but then the other bigger question which i'm sure we'll come on to is is how is the market going to react you know the closure of cinemas has been devastating for distributors and nobody really knows for sure when our model is going to come back so you know it's all very well kind of having these films, but are we going to be able to sell them in a way that's kind of effective and meaningful and are distributors going to want to acquire them? And that's kind of the bigger question that we face, but I'm sure we'll cover that a bit later on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we'll, we'll go on to talking about the CAN virtual market, but it would be, yeah, great to hear from a distributor's point of view as well, because obviously on the one hand, um, and I know that for both of you, the theatrical is an important component of your overall release strategies. But there's also been an interesting um, other side, I think, at the moment of like all these people stuck in their homes and seeing the consumption of content, whether it be film or television or other things, 
not Quibi, obviously, but everything else <laughs> seems to have really shot through the roof. And so maybe there are some also some kind of benefits from, from your perspectives, but it'd be great to hear Patrick maybe first from you and then we'll go to Eamon. Um, yeah, it's obviously a huge impact. Every film we've ever done has been theatrical led. So it's a real kind of key thing for us. We don't necessarily pick up films for just home entertainment. So, you know, to lose that and, you know, theatrical revenues kind of um, contribute a massive amount to our annual turnover. So yeah, it was it was really tough to take. And we had three films kind of prepped for release. So we had Vivarium, Sea Fever, and also Beards that was going to come out into the summer. So, you know, once things started closing down, just everything, you know, had to be looked at again. And with Bavarium and Sea Fever, the home entertainment portions of those releases were all set up and there was a US release happening. So unfortunately it was out of our hand. We didn't have much control. And then in terms of beards, we were working with Altitude in the UK and obviously Amazon came in with, with an offer there. And given the current climate, you know, the filmmakers in Altitude felt that was a good, good thing to do. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's been tough to take, but we, you know, similar to kind of Stephen, we've kind of used the time to kind of have a look at the way we do things, you know, and I can safely say that, you know, when or if things come back to normal, we'll be doing things in a very different way. And, you know, even our website, we've kind of tooled that up now. So, you know, it's very easy to see where films are available to view, but also uh, the technology we've incorporated into the website now in terms of uh, the tools that it has to kind of capture data that we can use for future marketing, you know, so, so that's gone well. And uh, we were quite lucky in terms of we'd some home entertainment kind of S4, sorry, subscription video on demand and TV deals lined up. So, you know, they were kind of kind of kept us going. And also the government supports in Ireland have been really helpful, you know, in terms of covering help cover overheads. So, um, but yeah, it, it has been tough. Um, but, you know, I think we'll be stronger when, when it all comes back. And, you know, those three films I mentioned are actually playing in Irish cinemas at the moment, Sea Fever, Vivarium and Dating Amber. So, you know, given all the fact the studio films have been pushed out now that Irish cinemas are beginning to open, there's a little bit of an opportunity. You know, audiences are, you know, people are going to be slow to turn out, but, you know, at least the films are there on the big screen, you know, and there's room for them to, you know. I would say that those, those films as well, for the most part, are probably aimed at a slightly younger audience, which seems like the audience that will yeah. turn at the moment, which um, is maybe... Is maybe yeah, the, the leaders are kids, kids' movies at the moment. It seems that parents who've been locked down with their children for several months are keen to get, a, get out of the house for something to do. So the top films in the chart are Onward and Trolls World Tour. Yeah. So. Before yeah. I go to Eamon, I'm just curious then, did you see though on the performance when you pivoted to the um, SVOD releases on um, Bavarium and Sea Fever, for instance, did you see them overperforming against your projections that you would have had previously or? So was that, was that to me, Katie, was it? That's you, yes, yeah. Um, like all the video on demand stuff seems to be performing okay, you know, um, it's hard because on any film, each each film is, is its own unique thing and it does better than, so it is hard to kind of, to gauge it against something else, but definitely in terms of interest and even monitoring kind of chatter online, specifically with Beards, I would have thought that went to Amazon, they did seem to push it. And there definitely seems to be a lot of online chatter that it would have gone from like a normal, actually the same for Vivarium and Sea Fever and Truth. If you were to just do a video on demand release in, in the normal scenario, um, we definitely find this time out there was definitely more uh, more business, yeah, and, and more kind of online chatter about it as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, they have been doing better than they would have normally, it's safe to say. Yeah, yeah, great. And Eamon, one of the developments in the US, which I thought was a kind of really smart, reactive move, was this, um, the kind of virtual cinema model, which was partnering. Yeah, yeah maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, but also your, your general response or, and the impact it's had on you. Yeah, a lot. Well, we set up this, uh, like, right after everything happened, we, you know, we just tried to switch everything to a, from theatrical to a virtual model. And uh, we worked with exhibitors or, that we usually work with around the country. And uh, we gave them a page, basically, a link to that, that you know, for each film. And so they can link to the film and, and they can buy it. And then for the first week we did it, all the proceeds went to the theaters. We were just trying to help them out. So we just, we just gave 100% of the proceeds to the theaters. And then afterwards, it's like we just share 50-50 our receipts with the theaters. And they generally have an elevated price as well. It's almost like a fundraiser to keep the theater in. in and that started out doing well. I don't know how well that's going to continue, to be mm -hmm. honest. I think the novelty factor and the kind of altruistic supporting the local, local art house theater, you know, 
impulse was strong in the beginning. I don't know if that's going to sustain, to be honest with you. It's, it's still, that, that part is still dwarfed by, by the platforms like Amazon or iTunes that will sell a film. Um, but it was good that we we're able to get some money to theaters. That, and that was our intent to sort of keep that, you know, it's an ecosystem. You know, you got to keep the, uh, the other members of the, of the, of, of the ecosystem alive. And uh, we'll see. It's, although that being said, it's, it's rough. I, like, I, I don't know when theatrical is going to come back. And even when it comes back for, for especially the art house audience, they're generally older. You know, they're, it's, it's not the, the young, you know, like the, the old British uh, traditional costume dramas and things like that that populate the art house theaters here. Those, I don't think those customers are coming back soon until there's a vaccine. I, I, I think it's all, I think it's very much going to be vaccine dependent in my position as a scientist. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really pretty Malthusian right now, I have to say. The good part is the VOD has increased, obviously, because there's this captive audience at home. Um, we saw big spikes in in it, and the Hulus and Netflixes of the world are absolutely killing it right now. Um, one of the issues is like getting people to pay a premium price for for films in this pandemic. You know, you really need to have something that's very compelling. Um, because they're, you know, everyone's just exhausting their Amazon, their Hulu, Prime, Hulu and Amazon Prime accounts, and you know, and frankly, a lot of people are out of work, and the economy is uncertain for a lot of people. So, you know, the impulse to pay extra money for product is not, you know, I wouldn't say as a, as robust as it would, normally would be, but that's countered by the fact that there's way more people sitting at home needing to watch stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. so, Okay, great. Um, thank you. That's a helpful but sobering <laughs> introduction. Um, yeah, it's going to be a while. I really, for theatrical, I think it really is going to be a while. Yeah. You know? Well, I think particularly in the US, when you see like it's 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 not quite under control yet in the same way that it is maybe in, in, in certain other territories. And, and it's also such a large country that, you know, there might yeah. be some states where things are a bit more under control. But when you're, you can see, even see it with tennis, like the whole release of tenet that they keep pushing back and back because they're hoping, they're betting on the US being able to be the thing that'll get people back into cinemas. Yeah, the thing in the United States that's scary is that New York actually, you know, was very responsible. The Northeast, you know, had a hard, you know, had an awfully, but uh, hunkered down and actually got it under control. It. But the thing is, around the rest of the country, it's being a lot of these Yahoo's are treating this like a political situation where they're not wearing their mask for political reasons. It's just like, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, you don't know what to say. It's and and. And those regions are just getting devastated now. And it, and it doesn't, the thing is, it doesn't, I'm, I'm scared about what's going to happen. It's been bad already, but I, I, you know, it does not, there's no stopping the spiking down in these uh, southern, southern cities usually. I mean, mostly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, one of the things you said, Eamon, there was just how, how the industry is an ecosystem. And I think that that's one of the things that I guess we are seeing is this, this spirit of collaboration and partnerships that maybe we wouldn't have seen before where, for instance, festivals might have been competing over titles and filmmakers and things now that there is very much this um, this spirit, at least for now, of collaboration. Um, Cara, I'd just be really interested to hear your view on, on that in the festival space and where you see the future of festivals in this kind of, in this kind of uncertain time. Yeah, I think um, there, there really was a, um, and continues to be a sentiment of solidarity among the festival community and, and wanting to support each other. We're in the business of live events. So um, until we can do that again, we have to think about how to eventize film um, in this situation. And one of the things we did with Tribeca was the, the We Are One um, Global Film Festival, which was a partnership with YouTube and 20 global film festivals um, to bring sort of the festival experience as much as we could online uh, in 10 days and sort of mirror that um, that model, that experience of having films premiere at certain times, having filmmaker Q&As, um, having the sort of, you know, appointment um, viewership, and then having a really robust lineup of international films, short films, um, director conversations. Uh, and, and the spirit of that really came from where Tribeca came from, which was a festival born out of 9-11 and out of trauma to a community and the, the reminder that film can um, bring us all together in, in, that, um, in that moment of crisis. And we felt like we had a unique kind of voice in this new crisis and how to adapt 
what it is we do um, to to the moment. And, and we reached out to all these festivals and it was incredible. Everyone we talked to said yes. So there was, uh, even when all of them um, more or less are dealing with their own cancellations, their own postponements, their own pivots, um, they all jumped in to kind of be a part of this. And that sentiment was really um, inspiring and heartwarming. And I, I hope it continues. You see it continued the fall festivals, the announcement they made about their partnership um, for for 2020, and uh, and I think that that helps audiences and helps filmmakers, and is is you know the way that we're all going to kind of get through this together. Yeah, yeah, and I think even even Sundance's announcement about how they're thinking about the festival for next year that it actually might be in a lot of different places and having a kind of localized localized sense that they can try and still bring people together, but under the Sundance brand, which is obviously like Tribeca, a really strong brand. Um, for you, sales and distribution, how important are, are, do you feel the fest, because obviously festivals are such an important way to launch a film, very often they're the way to, to kind of sell a film, uh, or even sometimes secure sales for a film, how, how important do you see that or what's the place for the festivals um, going forward? Stephen, let's maybe start with you. Yeah, um, you know, festivals are critical to the launch of, of the films that we work on and they bring so much in terms of offering a platform, you know, creating word of mouth, creating, um, you know, press discussion, reviews, you know, it's really the mechanism we use to be able to distribute films successfully. So entering this time where festivals can't happen in the way that they would ordinarily does present kind of huge questions and huge challenges for us. Um, you know, we don't know any other way of, of, of launching films in the world and presenting films to, to audiences. It's all we've ever done. So having to find new or different ways of doing that um, is, is, is not without its challenges. Um, you know, I think the fact that festivals are reinventing themselves for this year and being alternate versions of themselves, I think is a really positive thing. And even though they're very likely to be non-physical and the, the number of films that are selected is going to be less, I still think they will play an important part for the films that are selected. But it's just a completely new way of doing things and a completely different way of doing things. And, and because selections are smaller, we're now having to look at the prospects of launching films out of a festival, you know, directly going to distributors, um, which is not unachievable, but again, it's just something we've never done before. And, and you do miss that kind of um, fanfare that a festival brings to any particular production. So I don't have any answers. It's just, this is the world that we're living in and we have to navigate it as best as we can, always with the interest of, of the film in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one to call because we had that with, we had a film, The Racer, which was going to South by Southwest. And we, um, obviously that was canceled, but we'd already set up fire screenings for it and decided to, let's go ahead with those anyway. But I suppose you can't help because we were just, there's, there's so much uncertainty. We don't know if there's any value in waiting. We don't know when this is all going to kind of write itself again. And we're really lucky in that we got a, we got a deal. Um, yeah. and, and that's a fantastic thing. And I think that really helped us bring the film into the can virtual market but yeah. you know it's you don't have that social media chatter even from an audience you don't have the film reviews you don't have the buzz and like that is that is so much about um how, how you know i don't know how films get out there the word of mouth is really important um patrick what about for you how do you yeah definitely in terms of irish releases we would you know we would always look at the irish festival you know launch as a key part of that and kind of what you're saying is just that kind of buzz of having a full theater you know, we're here virtually at Go With Fla, but you know, in the past we'd have premiered ex your own extraordinary young, young young offenders played here, Carbo Gangsters, you know, Michael inside a lot of them. And at those screenings in a packed town hall, you, you know yourself, it's just, it's really, it's really buzzy. And you can, you know, for us as a distributor, I wouldn't say it's like a test screening, but you know, a lot of times when you can see the audience reaction firsthand, it will kind of inform, you know, your campaign on a film a lot of times and seeing the social media chatter as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're gonna miss that this year. We do have Redemption of a Rogue playing uh, tomorrow night for the world premiere. And we had Nocturnal play a few nights ago that played London previously. And, you know, you can't help feeling that you do kind of miss, will miss being in the room, you know, but um, this is kind of where we are at the moment. And with some of those films, you know, you kind of don't want to hang around because like, who's to say what's going to happen, you know, 
in the next couple of months or years. So you kind of have to get on with it at the same time, you know? Um, so like in the business we're in, I don't think anyone's kind of going to be sitting around and just kind of sitting on their hands, just hoping, you know, I, I think we need to look at the landscape and just kind of, you know, play what's in front of us essentially. And, you know, uh, I think the films we have this year will still, you know, will still be released theatrical. Um, but we do miss at the moment that, that festival. And, you know, it's always said for Irish films as well that, you know, audiences often kind of react better to something that's gone internationally and have had a claim. So, you know, for Irish films to kind of miss that opportunity as well to play internationally and come back with a bit of buzz. And, you know, even like when we did Hole in the Ground, you know, we were able to go out to Irish media, talk about all the buzz it got from the Sundance screening, you know, when it premiered there. And so even for us as a distributor, using those international screenings as a way to kind of talk to Irish media and audiences about the international success, we're kind of missing out on that as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it is a shame at the moment. And Eamon, for you as well, I guess, the types of films that you tend to pick yeah. up, you know, independent I think, documents. I really feel bad about the festivals I'm outside of the festival programmers and people involved with them are the sales agents because there there's no replication for having a packed audience like waiting to see a film that really delivers and you get that sort of comp competitive spirit going among the distributors that's that that's hard for i, I think to replicate in in, the, in this world like i'm i there, there's been a couple of films i saw that we made actually pretty good buys on recently that i think would have been much you know it, it's hard for people to focus as well you don't have that flashpoint where yeah, everybody's watching about this film and that's the one. You know, people see it at different times. There's, you know, and they don't have the, you know, and frankly, they don't have that, chill, you know, that, that aspect of, the, of, of someone really just raving about it and their competitor hearing someone raving about it. And maybe they're on a fence, but they're not going to get left behind. So they get in the bidding, you know, it's that sort of aspect is really, you know, that's going to be missed by the sales agents. For, for us, to be honest, launching films, it's definitely, you know, festivals are a big part of it. I think in the United States, since we're so damn egocentric, we don't, we don't care about being validated by outside our territory, like, which I, I, I do find that when I hear, talk to people around the world, is that how important, can, like, just getting into Cannes is, and, and other big festivals for their funding, etc. You know, it doesn't even matter if they perform, it's just that they got to these festivals, which I have to tell you, no one in America cares about whether they got to an international film festival. Like if it played in Cannes, like outside of a few, you know, maybe getting a few more high end critics to review your film, the, the, the man on the street, the film goer does not really notice or care. But, you know, festivals domestically, though, to launch and to get, you know, to, there's nothing like getting a bunch of bodies in a room and having a communal experience that you know, that, that gets word of mouth going and get, and gets a profile for your film. Yeah. That's going to be missed. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if, if that then, it, will it impact the types of films that you're looking to pick up now? Yes. Yes. There's no question about it. Like right now, we're, we're not looking to anything that is just looks like heavy lifting theatrically that, you know, it really needs to have that theatrical thing. I mean, we'll, well, obviously, if a film's good, we're going to like be interested in it, and because we'll figure out some way to, you know, make it live and 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 get and get some commerce out of it. But um, but we won't be spending a lot of money towards films that I that you know really need that that have to live on that theatrical profile. Um, you know, we, and, and conversely, we might spend a little more money that because of things that we'll live online because we don't have to spend as much marketing on it then. You know, so it's it's like the total equation of what you spend on the film, you know, in general. Yeah, um, yeah. but uh, the, yeah, there's definitely like, you know, if, you know, interesting, John, we just released this John Lewis documentary, which we were planning a big theatrical on. And, oh my God, I, I mean, I can't believe like the timing on this film, you know, it's like Black Lives Matter has happened, the whole country is, is, is you know, inspired and, and we bring out the man whose everybody's shoulders are standing on. And with that, we really wanted to do a big theatrical. That would have been enormous theatrically, especially with the older African-American film goers who don't probably use digital and cable, you know, uh, VOD as much. Oh, yeah. But we had to switch it over to, we had to switch it over to the VOD. And it did very, very well. You know, we were, you know, we were happy with the results. But, uh, you know, it wasn't the explosive thing we thought we might have had out of, out of theatrical release. Mm -hmm. You know, but... Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, but we'll, I mean, we'll, it, it did very well, though, and I think it will continue to do well. Great. Um, Stephen, what about for you? I guess, I mean, you did say that you were thinking, you, it made you think more carefully about what you, the kinds of films, your, your acquisitions, um, but also I'm curious to hear your experience if you participated in the Cannes virtual market um, and, and how that went this year, because obviously it was a bit of an experiment. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is probably the interesting part, to be honest. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, there were all these questions about what is our business going to become? You know, is there still a business here? And none of us knew the answer to that. We were literally kind of treading water for a number of weeks. Like, when, when are we going to be in a position when we can present films to distributors and distributors are going to want to buy them? And Virtual Can was a real kind of positive in that way. You know, it gave concrete dates where the intention is for people to buy and sell films. Whether they do actually buy and sell films remains to be seen, but these are the dates we're going to try and do it. And everybody went into it, you know, I think everybody embraced it and everybody went into it with positivity, but not really having any idea whether it was going to work or not. And I think it's broadly accepted that it worked and it worked really well. Um, you know, you just have to read the trades to look at the reports of the deals and it's all super positive. And, you know, not to make light of the difficult situation that we're all in, but it was our best can ever. Wow. So we had a really, really positive experience. So that kind of shows that our business is looking ahead. It's trying to look beyond COVID and to when cinemas come back, theatrical comes back. Um, you know, the majority of the business we did was on films that have not been made yet. That's so right. there's lag time in that. There's time for things to get back to normal. And distributors were really aggressive on those films. So it shows that there is a confidence about what is to come, even though we don't know what is to come. But certainly, you know, the market felt extremely robust to me. Yeah, that is really great to hear. And actually, it's a similar experience. We had a, there's a film that I'm co-producing called Mr. Malcolm's List, which West End are selling. Yeah, and so congrats it, on the we just announced Bleecker Street bought it for the US yesterday. And it was, it was a really, really strong deal. And I think, um, I think that goes back as well to like, that's a rom-com, um, but with um, a really, um, I guess colorblind casting, I guess, in terms of it really is focused on representation. And that was something that just felt maybe in this zeitgeist is actually something that there's a real appetite for. Um, so it's great to hear that there are green shoots and there are opportunities as well. Um, Patrick, what about for you? Um, yeah, like definitely kind of look, looking forward now, you know, I'm kind of excited for things to kind of get, get back up and running. Um, in terms of can, like we kind of didn't do much. We have a kind of a, a pretty full slate, some of which a lot of I can't really talk about, but you know we are going to be uh, working on the Shane McGowan doc later on the year. So I know Eamon has that in Mag with Magnolia. So we're really excited about that, and um, yeah, you're just kind of looking looking forward now to to you know getting to work on those projects. And I said the Irish cinemas are back now, you know, so they're not all open, but there's about maybe thirty or forty of them open. And, and how, have they been, how have they been doing? Do you have any reports yet of what the numbers have been like? Yeah, I think it's kind of slow, but it's expected to be slow for now. You know, I said the positive thing is that I think there's opportunity there in terms of when the studios keep moving their movies back, their films back, that, you know, when it starts to pick up, there is going to be, at least in the short term, some opportunities there for independent films, you know. Um, and I know there's kind of social distancing and kind of capacity caps and things like that. But, you know, um, I, I, th I think it's, you know, for a certain level of kind of, you know, um, independent film, I think it, it might work okay in the short term. I just hope the cinemas can kind of keep going. You know, some of them are struggling a lot, you know, and I've had word of one closure already uh, in Ireland, you know, so um, ho hopefully they, they can kind of get back up and running soon. Um, I'm conscious of our audience. There's probably a lot of um, filmmakers who are watching this and either they have a film that they are packaging and looking to kind of get the finance on or they might have a, com a completed film that they're trying to figure out their festival strategy on or even um, a film that's in post. Um, so it would be great to hear, um, starting maybe Car with you, what your advice would be on how it might be best to kind of approach, obviously, you know, films are all different. It might depend on the genre, but just any kind of nuggets that you might have to share. Yeah, I think, you know, this is, 
the question that we have as well, I think we're about to open submissions for our next year's festival and, and we're planning to um, to move forward in, next year in 2021 for our, our next edition. So we're hoping that there's films to submit and films to, to look at, but I think what 2021 looks like will be informed by everything we've been through. So um, we wanna do that really collaboratively with filmmakers and hear about what they need if it continues to be virtual aspects to the the premiere experience, um, what cinemas look like in New York, I think communicate, um, talk about kind of what you need and, and be adaptive, um, but also do what's, what's right for your film because there's so many different kind of models floating around now and they're not, there isn't a one size fits all for, for every film. So we've certainly seen that as we've talked to people, as we've done an, an online festival, as we've done a um, you know private buyers um, screening series of our films, as we've done drive-ins, uh, which films are kind of open to and benefiting from each of those is different. And and we really want to um, kind of work with the films to figure out the best way that we as a festival can support them and, and get them get the work done that they need to get done around their film. Great. Stephen, what would, what's, uh, what's been your approach? Well, I mean, I'm trying to think of, of the audience again and kind of what I can say that's useful for them. You know, I think I do feel positive about the future. I don't feel like this is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, an industry ending moment, you know, it's just something that we have to get through and the demand for content is never going to go away. You know, we've spoken about um, the vast amounts of content that's being consumed by people at home during lockdown and, and that will continue and cinema will come back. So I think, you know, it's definitely a, a, a bright future and a, and a solid future for, for the industry. Um, in terms of, of filmmaking and, and how you kind of uh, fit your project into that. For me, it's, it's all about uniqueness and distinctiveness and individuality and allowing people to uncover a story that perhaps um, they haven't seen before or haven't experienced before. So it's, it's really to just strive to be, to be different, I think. So not a, not a bunch of pandemic lockdown. No, definitely no pandemic. <laughs> Although I did see that Contagion was one of the top performers on Netflix over the last couple of months. You know? yeah. yeah, I think there is a resistance. That, that, I think that's the early days of the pandemic. I mean, was... <laughs> uh, yeah, just in terms of content ourselves. You know, actually, it's kind of stuff that we always wanted to do anyway, you know, more audio like stuff that is kind of, you know, interest to a wider audience and those kind of, you know, it's a bit traditional genres, but like, you know, the kind of comedies and horrors and just people, you know, film bigger films that people kind of will enjoy watching. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure what the data is showing if people are staying away from the more heavier material, but um, maybe Eamon or, or Stephen would know that. But it feels like people are probably, you know, willing or wanting to watch maybe, you know. I feel like... I think people have well, certainly kind of distributors and and streamers have decided that people don't want to watch dark subject matter and don't want to watch films about pandemics. So that will be the future for the moment. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't even think it's like dark subject matter so much. I I think anything that like is like you could have a horror film that will you know be bleak, but people will still watch that. I think it's just that, that immersive thing. I think. Things that get away from the present reality, though, are, you know, film's always been about escapism, like going to the movies, getting away. But I think it's going to be much more profound in the next year or so that, you know, because you're you're stuck there. You, we, had a, we had a documentary, Slay the Dragon, about gerrymandering. Hey, great film. Who wants to see a film about gerrymandering in the midst of the pandemic? You know, we were going to go theatrical and we had to switch it to online and it really did not perform at all. And it's, it's a terrific film, too. It really is. And... Uh, and played Tribeca last year, actually. That's where we, we saw it. Uh, but no one, we could not get anybody's attention on it. I mean, it's just like, there was just, you know, if they're going to watch, it, you know, they want to get away from the headlines. They want to get away from news stories. And uh, unless they're right in the middle of it and are inflamed that day, it's, it's really hard to get people to watch that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as well from the distribution point of view, because obviously the other thing that's impacted here is like award season and um, whether, you know, all the big stars are going to want to gather in a, in a theater together um, in, in some whatever. I know they've pushed a little bit next year, but does that have a big, does that also have an impact um, from a distribution point of view or will it? Um, 
Are you talking about iftas now or? Uh, it makes me come out here the beach is now longer. It's like, you know, I'm trying to <laughs> collapse this, uh, this academy season, which once it hits November, everything is about, you know, from November to February, everything is about Academy Awards. It's, it's, it makes it hard to re release other films that aren't, you know, prestige worthy at, at those times. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting this year just to see how, how it affects or whether people are really going to be caring that much. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It will be. yeah and just like this, you know, normally those are busy times, but it's going to be interesting to see if a lot of the films that were scheduled, you know, did a lot of them go online in the end? And, you know, obviously there's a backlog created by the cinemas being closed, but also, you know, not a lot of films are in production. So there's going to be a gap there as well. So I'll just- That's what I'm worried there. about. That, if everything's just going to even itself out over the period or or not. Yeah, that, that production gap is the thing I'm really worried about because there's going to be, you know, it's a, a bunch of months where there's limited or no or very little production and it's going to hit the, the distribution cycle at some point you know? yeah it will and also because i think the things that are starting to get back into production are the are the things that are being financed by the studios or the netflixes that have deep pockets and are willing to underwrite the insurance whereas the kind of smaller indie films don't yeah. have the same safety net so that's tricky and i think the other thing certainly we've been thinking about as a company as producers and i know a lot of other producers it was already happening in terms of this move to tv or certainly at least balancing your slate more between um and feature and television and um and that i just wonder like you know over this time whether that will also create more of a more of a talent drain from the kind of feature space to to tv yeah it, it, i would imagine that yes i think it will yeah yeah um it's like you know the, the, you know, to echo what Steve, Steven said before, you know, filmed entertainment, people are always going to want content. That's that's the one thing. I mean, and the other thing is, at least for the short term, we're going to have pro probably a wider audience consuming it, you know, just because they're home and they're just watching more and more and more stuff. Um, you know, filmed entertainment's never going to go away. The medium may change, like, you know, the, the distribution platforms are cha will change, but filmmakers, you know, you know, Artists got to make art, you know, and that's that's always going to be a, an eternal. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. And that is a, a, a positive thing to hold on to. Um, I'm thinking of the particularly Irish UK market, the other thing that we're going to have coming up at the end of the year, um, which I think is worthwhile just getting your views while you're here is, is Brexit. Um, do you have concerns over the impact that that might have on the um, on distribution? It's terrible. I kind of half forget about Brexit. <laughs> on. And yeah, we, you know, we were front of the mind for so long and then it's, you know, oh yeah, that's still there. Um, yeah, there's, um, I think in the short term, probably it won't change massively. I guess, you know, people always talk about here at least, you know, is the market going to divide, you know, that UK Ireland Thing, you know, I guess for kind of certain kind of tax and business reasons, there might be, um, you know, maybe some of the larger UK companies might be interested in setting up in Ireland, have an Irish or slash EU base. Um, I know we definitely think about maybe being more located in, in the UK as well, if that makes a, a, a you know, financial sense. Um, so, but in terms of how films are, are distributed, like the thing is when we acquire films now it makes it massively beneficial for us to have the uk rights as well as ireland just because um not necessarily in the theatrical space but when you get into home entertainment you know those uk irish rights are kind of packaged together when you want to do deals with a lot of the platforms mm -hmm. so you know it'll be interesting to see how that side of things post brexit will that still remain you know um i know Stephen always has trouble separating the territories as well from her previous experiences um so yeah in terms of brexit it's a bit bit hard to know now i have to say yeah um i'm sure sarah will be on to, back on in a couple of minutes to um have some questions from the audience so um if you do have any just stick them in the q a and um, i see there's a few there gathered already but um i think it's also good to <laughs> to kind of maybe reflect before we finish on on and we've said the need for content that's always going to be there and i think that has been an incredibly heartening thing like even whether it's film or whether it's um whether it's TV, seeing the success, the global success of something like Normal People has been a really, you know, amazing thing across this time. But I think there's also probably been some like um, personal benefits, whether that is having some space to think professionally about 
where you want your company to go. For me, I think even just being able to stay still for a few months as a producer, it's often you're like a vagabond <laughs> going around the world to different festivals or, you know, um, meetings and traveling a huge amount. And I think that, that has been a benefit both personally, but also, I guess, you know, from a from a climate point of view. Um, what are uh, any of your own good uh, news stories or positive takeaways from, from the past few months, Cara? Um, I think it's actually been really exciting to see um, the enthusiasm for some of the new initiatives we've had and different kinds of storytelling. Like we put our entire Cinema 360 VR program online and it had just massive viewership, tens of times as much as would have seen it during the, the physical film festival. And so to see audiences kind of opening up to st kinds of um, storytelling that they wouldn't have sought out in the past. And then us as a festival saying, um, you know, what what can we do with our platform that's different than what we've done? So the the shakeup I think is, has been a positive one ultimately that's gonna continue to impact what we look like as a festival and how audiences interact with the kinds of programming that we have in a really positive way. So our out of, out of the limitations comes creativity and comes change um, that I hope will, will continue to be positive change. Stephen? I mean, I would agree with what, what um, you and Cara have said. Um, I think from a personal point of view, just like you said, Katie, the opportunity to stop and just think. And, you know, I often refer to our business as like a hamster wheel or a traveling circus, you know, you're on a circuit and kind of once you get on it's very hard to get off and you just keep going round and round and round which is fun and great and you know enables us to work on amazing films and discover amazing films but it's pretty relentless and so from a personal point of view just being able to stop and pause and think a bit and lower the the stress level a little bit I think has been really really positive and kind of given room to think about the future and what you want to do and how to do things differently because the second thing I think is that it will it, in one way or another it will change the way we work forever whether that's the festival and market circuit or the way films are distributed or the theatrical window for example you know I think it's going to bring about a lot of change and it's kind of opened the door for that because otherwise we would have just carried on the way we were and um, nothing would have changed so so there are positives for sure. Patrick what about you? Yeah just to, to echo what's kind of been said you know um it has been nice to kind of you know for us kind of theatrical releases every time one rolls around it's like all hands on deck and a lot of them are event-based you know be you know premieres and special screenings and q a's and um so to be able to take the time to think of the business model and also i've noticed that you know i think historically producers would always be tied to theatrical releases and now we're finding that people are kind of a bit more open on the future film side to kind of explore other avenues for the film and see the benefits and you know, I guess the other ways, you know, if people are seeing their films, they, they're seeing that as a real positive. So, um, yeah, and yeah, it's just been nice kind of spending time at home and family and reflecting on a lot of things. And I, I think probably a lot of people in the industry aren't too keen to go back to that kind of, what's Stephen called hamster wheel kind of thing, you know, and I think there'll be much more of a mix of kind of working from home and, and working remotely and, and, and things like that. So, um, yeah. A few less air miles. Yes, definitely. Uh, I agree with all that, especially the hamster wheel aspect of it, you know, to be able to kind of uh, not have to get in and, and commute two and a half hours a day and go into the office. And and the other thing I've, I've the other blessing that I think has come out of it is I've been amazed how efficient the virtual office office has been. I mean, we mm -hmm. yeah. people are working hard now. I don't know if that's going to continue so much in the future because it's obviously such it's so rife for chances of abuse, you know, but but in, in this term, it's been fantastic. And I, yeah, I look at it and you know, like Patrick said, I don't see going back to a normal, a normal you know, five day a week in the office situation. I, you know, necessity is the mother invention. I think we've seen a lot of things that, that are possible now that we've had to do them, you know, that, that it's, you know, it's possibly a good thing for the future. Great, thank you all, Sarah. Well, we're kind of getting close to our, our 3 p.m. knockoff here. So there are quite a few questions coming in, so I might just throw them out. I mean, there's a good one has come in from Tony Tracy and he wants to know, um, will release windows end and are we more likely to see simultaneous releases now? And will that be a positive? 
Um, in terms of UK Ireland, that'll be a question for the uh, you know the the large multiplexes. You know, the Irish exhibitors are usually pretty good. And, uh, there's a little bit of flexibility there, but uh, in terms of Ireland UK market, Cineworld, Odeon, and View, the main multiplexes, all in system sixteen weeks, um, which is a long time. And even in the US, I mean, it's twelve weeks in the US, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's like three months. Yeah, so roughly. So um, you know, the UK Ireland is a bigger window. Um, I, I think there's room for kind of different models. I think if, if you're in the art house space, you know, I think there should be flexibility there in terms of, you know, a reduction of windows or day and date. I guess the problem is for the UK, like the picture house insists on windows and they're a key art house site. So that kind of poses a problem. They're owned by Cineworld. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it should be kind of addressed. I would like to see it kind of, you know, not necessarily anyone going on a solo run with it. It would be nice if it was kind of some, not necessarily, formal agreement but some understanding between exhibition and distributors so it's not so kind of it's not such a heated issue all, all, all the time yeah I, I think it's going to be in the united states i think it's going to be the big pictures the big tent pole releases are going to have the strict windows in the future like the big event cinemas and i think everything else is going to be catch as catch can ultimately you know there's going to be all sorts of windows we, it's been happening already before this and i think this is just going to crumble the wall further great and another one, Cara, you might be able to chat about this um, from Alva Hoopum. She's asked, um, with the success of virtual film festivals, like, like Virtual Cannes and We Are One, does it make sense to continue these as physical fe festivals um, or, or kind of have a mix of both, perhaps? Yeah, I think you'll, you'll see the sort of hybrid versions. Um, certainly at Tribeca, we've talked about what a, an, a continued online component to our festival would look like even once we're back um, in a physical space. I think being able to expand the impact of the festival and seeing the success that we've had with audiences and with certain films where, you know, films end up online eventually anyway. So what is the role for a festival in, um, in kind of that piece of the journey in the same way that will world premiere a film? Do we have a role to play in kind of the online premiere? Uh, and I think our experience so far has been that, yes, there's, there's a desire for that and there's a way to eventize that. So um, that's certainly something that we're looking at kind of uh, implementing in a more permanent way. We Are One um, now has grown this sort of massive online following. So how do we keep that audience engaged now that we've um, met them and, and have, their, um, have their following? Um, what do we continue to deliver to them through that, um, that brand? So um, I think a lot of festivals will continue to do uh, online components to what they're what they're already doing, but I, I don't think that will entirely replace the appetite for the physical experience, which I know we're all working towards um, bringing back. Absolutely. I mean, this question came in from Topher Neville, but it was quite early in the conversation. So we may we may have addressed it, but he asked, "Is there any hope for independent films and their distribution now, um, in the new horizon that emerges after the pandemic?" Was there ever? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, I, I think totally. I, and the thing is, I, I think the thing that might help it is, is what everybody's a little afraid of it is the preponderance of the small screen uh, viewership. And I think I think in this, as people get deeper and deeper into their what's available to them on TV, I, I think there's going to be more things that people are going to be exposed to and more things that they'll more rabbit holes they'll go down. So I do think that, you know, independent film is total this on the smaller scale. Like I said, it might be it might even be a, a boon for it, ultimately. Yeah, I, I do get the sense people are watching a broader spectrum of things during these yeah. last few months and maybe watching some things they, they wouldn't have before. So maybe people's you know, horizons have been broadened and, you know. And you know what? I, I, so many of those Netflix, they churn them out, those like, you know, sort of soft, you know, audience friendly films. Those things are terrible. I mean, really, it's you watch a few of those and just like you know what's going on. It's soft. No one's going to get a, you know. It's it's that that's a, is mind numbing to me. And I think people will you know at some point want real substance. Those things you get burned out on those things. They're just like you know people still watch them, but I don't know. It's really insubstantial. I find. Well, hopefully we'll get somebody from Netflix next year aiming to address that. <laughs> yeah. Come to the film. Yeah, come to the Go Away Film Fair and there, speak about my, that. My, <laughs> there's certain things in there, but their their main body of work, as far as originals, is all like. Whoa. And when, like, do you you there. might have a good opinion on this. And um, so, how much social media should a writer or director do while writing or filming a project? 
is it good to build that audience in pre-production or should they wait until the film is in post or completed? I know from, from you as a producer, you may have a, quite a, a lot of thoughts on that. Oh, um, I think it can it can depend. I mean, I think it's, it's I think it's good for writers, directors to have a social media presence. I think the question is how much of the they reveal about the actual film, because very often I think distributors or sales agents will want to hold on things like releasing stills or whatever for the time when actually you can get in front of audiences and on eyeballs. But I think certainly having a social media presence and a voice and an audience that follows you can be is a really valuable thing and an increasingly valuable thing not only just for the writer directors and, and production companies but also the talent that are involved because anything you can do to help amplify the 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 release of the film is 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 going to be beneficial to it great but, but don't let the tail wag the dog make the film good that's more yeah. that's where your energies really uh, need to be absolutely so Karen, i might just ask when are you opening up again perhaps for applications just so that the audience know we haven't announced uh, yet. We're talking about this right now. Uh, typically, we open in August, so we're working towards that. But um, you know, obviously, <laughs> everything is different. Um, but hopefully, we'll be uh, we'll be open later this summer. Great, Patrick. Redemption for Rogue is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, yeah. And we're launching the trailer teaser trailer today. So the timing of this call wasn't ideal. So <laughs> I think it could be out within the hours. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, it's a great film. It's a little under the radar. Um, uh, Irish comedy musical set in Cavan. So uh, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, so try and watch it if you can. Great. So look, um, we're, we're just coming up to kind of the hour marker. So I just want to say a huge thank you to you all, to Katie, to Cara, Stephen, Patrick and Eamon for giving us kind of an hour of your day. I think there's been a really interesting conversation and actually the best takeaway is that it's not the kind of doom and gloom I think that we kind of maybe would have thought at the beginning of at two o'clock when we started this conversation. So thank you for that and thank you for giving us hope, I suppose, as filmmakers and, and financiers about the future. I think it still looks quite optimistic. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's joined us today. I think we've had kind of over, you know, 130, 140 people just view on this session again. And I don't know what the numbers have been on other platforms. And we've had great viewership over the last three days of, of the three webinars. Um, so again, thank you to you all. Um, continue to support the Goy Film FLA. Um, they have a great program over the next couple of days that you can view online virtually. Um, obviously, we hope very strongly that in 2021, myself at the RAP Fund, uh, Miriam and all at the Goy Film FLA will have you all back in Galway and to the west of Ireland for the festival. I think we, we've all, we all know there's, there's, no, there's no replacement for the actual festival itself and being able to have a, a pint with everybody in the rowing club. Um, I suppose just as I sign off, I suppose there's a phrase that comes to mind, an Irish phrase called Niarska Curla Kela, which means um, in strength there's unity. And I think it's a great time to kind of use that phrase because I think it's, it's um, what we're all trying to do now. So I would say, you know, to everybody watching and to everybody, just take care, stay safe. And hopefully again, we'll see you all very soon in 2021. Uh, Sarah, can, can I just say thanks to Screen Ireland over the last couple of months? They were like, they've been so supportive to you know, all aspects of the Irish film industry, you know, um, in terms of production and, and, and distribution and just their support has been really appreciated. Actually, and I 100% echo that. I don't think the Irish industry would be able to function without the support. And I know, Katie, you are a member of the board without the actions, the very positive actions that Screen Ireland have, have taken, you know, at least in supporting this event and in supporting the FLA itself in general as well. So guys, again, just want to say a huge thank you. It's long fall and hopefully we'll catch up soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.